Hi guys, this is um, chapter 16's lecture, plants, fungi, and move on to land. So there's a lot of information in this chapter. So have your outlines with you. And we're gonna start with plants. Um, this, however, the, your um, sort of intro picture is a very large truffle, which is a fungus. And this one cost um, $330,000 to whoever bought it. It is a very rare one. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of truffle oil or truffle being, you know, truffles being served at fancy restaurants, but they're rare, so they cost a lot of money and they have some kind of, I don't know, clout because of that, the rarity. Um, so let's take a look at this um, plants versus algae. So we finished the discussion on algae, green algae, um, being a um, ancestor of plants. And so what is the difference between algae and plants, right? So let's take a look at the first question. Um, eukaryotic, are plants and algae eukaryotic? Is one of them prokaryotic? So the answer is they're both eukaryotic, right? They're both eukaryotes. Are they both photosynthetic? Yes, they are. They both can photosynthesize. Are they both multicellular? Yes, they are multicellular. And uh, the last one, are they adapted to water or to land? So that's your big um, clue. Algae have uh, their bodies are adapted to water and their sort of life sustaining processes, reproduction, that's all water based. And then plants moved to land. So plants have features of their structures that adapted them to the land. Okay, so this is our sort of um, filled in picture, right? So let's start with algae. Algae is surrounded by water. So the water supports their body. So the algae can be very flimsy and floppy because they don't have to have any hard parts to support them against gravity. Um, they also have a completely green body because their entire structure can support photosynthesis, right? They don't have to have modified structures to hold them up or to do anything else. So they can just entirely photosynthesize. And then in the water, itself, right? You have carbon dioxide dissolved in the water, you have oxygen dissolved in the water, you have minerals from the water. So their entire body, since it's submerged in water, can absorb those nutrients that they need just being, you know, surrounded by it. But once you move to land, uh, you're not in water anymore. So you're subjected to a lot of different kinds of pressures, selection pressures. So the first one is, well, <clears throat> you're not going to hold yourself up. Um, you know, there's no water to hold yourself up. So Plants will develop, you know, land plants will develop stems or um, called shoots. So everything above the earth is a shoot. The stems, which is part of the shoot, will support the plant against gravity. You have specialized structures just for photosynthesis. And why leaves are broad like that and flat is because it's, you allow more surface area to um, contact the sun to, um, for photosynthesis. Um, you have specialized reproductive structures such as flowers and with specialized areas that are modified to help the flower reproduce. Um, let's go back to algae. So the way algae reproduce is basically having the gametes float around in the water and so you have a, a moist environment where the cells can stay intact. But on land, the cells would dry out, right? So if you have a tiny egg cell or a tiny sperm cell, in a few minutes it would completely dry out and it would die. So plants on land have developed a way to protect their eggs and sperm in ways, in different ways, we'll look at those, um, but to protect them from drying out. And then lastly, we have roots. So roots are gonna anchor the plant to the earth and the minerals and water are gonna be absorbed through the roots. So the whole plant's not, uh, not surrounded by water anymore. So you have specialized structures to absorb water from the earth uh, along with um, your minerals. Okay, so remember that plants create their own sugar, so their leaves are going to re be responsible for um, manufacturing glucose through photosynthesis, and then the minerals and, and water come from the roots. All right, so I think we covered uh, letter A, right? So the characteristics of um, organisms in the water or algae in the water, but on land you have different kinds of um, factors you need to think about and what makes them different. So we're just going to go through each one. So the shoot system, right, we've mentioned that the shoots are everything above the, um, the earth. 
So we have stems, right, that hold the plant against gravity. So we can see that the beige color here is going to be the network of the structures that hold the plant up against gravity. Some plants will become woody, and there's a specialized um, molecule here that helps to build the wood, especially in barks, in the bark of trees, and that would be called lignin. And then we have leaves, which are specialized for photosynthesis, right? So they're mainly uh, broad and they're usually flat and broad for the um, catching the sun rays. Um, because the nature of the leaves are flat and broad, they tend to dehydrate very quickly. So we mentioned this before in class, how the plants um, will coat their leaves with a cuticle, which is a layer of wax just on the surface that faces the sun, right? So the upper surface of the leaf, and that's to minimize water loss through dehydration, right? So we want to protect that. The bottom part of your leaf that is in the shade will be um, not waxy because the wax would basically make diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide really difficult. So the bottom of the leaves don't have the wax. They're going to be more dull in appearance, but they're going to have stomates. Remember, stomates are those pores for gas exchange. Now I want to show you this really cool video of um, a pore opening. Okay, actually I meant closing, but here you go. So you can see these are the guard cells that create the pore in the center, and the pore or the opening in the center is getting smaller and smaller as that stomate is closing. So that was in real time, so it's a little slow, but really cool. So number two, roots. Uh, roots are going to anchor the plants to the earth and help absorb nutrients, um, which, such as minerals, right, from and water from the soil. So this is just a really nice picture of the root network that we don't see because most of the time this is underground, right? So it's very extensive. And sometimes I've heard other people say that you know, for how however large the plant is um, that you can see above the soil. The plant is just as extensive underneath the soil. Um, <clears throat> this is a special case, mycorrhizae, and I actually have it spelled incorrectly in the outline. I don't know if I fixed that um, uh, for the updated version you have, but it's this is the correct spelling. And this is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and plant roots. So the fungi here appear as a fuzzy kind of hairy substance, right? So we can see the prominent sort of yellow golden color of the roots of the plant itself. This is actually a little pine tree. And then we can see the fuzzy halo of the network of um, fungi. So the network of fungi that you see is, um, is called a mycelium. And uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the chapter today, but this is that, so it's a symbiotic relationship between the two. So we have fungi and we have the plant, and you can see that the mycorrhizae are gonna help the tree acquire hundreds and even thousands of times more nitrogen, phosphorus, zinc, copper, and other nutrients that would be possible without. So the fungi have a, pro a way of breaking down nutrients, absorbing the nutrients into themselves, and then giving those nutrients to the, the roots of the plant. So there must be some kind of cooperative um, nature here where the fungi can also get a benefit from the plant. Most of the time the, the plant will give um, a, a niche um, for the fungi to survive and to live. Um, but that's a really cool symbiotic relationship there. All right, number three, vascular tissue. So the word vascular means vessels. So we talk about even animals, when we talk about our vascular system, we talk about our arteries and veins, so our blood vessels. But in plants, they don't have blood, right? They have um, different vessels that are gonna transport water, they're gonna transport sap or the sugary um, water that they create in their leaves. So you can see here that the blue color, right? The blue is gonna indicate something called xylem. Xylem is a kind of vessel, so it's a hollow tube and it's gonna transport 
water and minerals from the roots to the leaves. So you can see that the arrows are going up, right? And these, the xylem tends to be dead. So the cells that create the xylem eventually die and that tube is made of dead cells. Number two, the phylum, right? Oh, I'm sorry, the phloem. The phloem is a network of vessels, different, um, that are going to bring the substances that are made in the upper part of the plants. So namely the sugars that are made in the leaves are gonna be transported to all different parts of the plant. Because remember, the leaves specialize for photosynthesis. So the green parts of the plants will photosynthesize. The sugar is created there, but then every single part of the plant needs sugar to burn to make fuel, right? To make ATP. So the phloem is going to go down into the roots, but it also goes up into the upper parts of the plant. So the phloem is more of a two way network, but if you want to think in, in general terms, right, uh, really the, the leaves are at the top of the plant and phloem generally moves that sugar down. So you can think about it as like xylem up and flow, flowing down, right? The phloem goes down. But um, I have the word living there because the phloem is made of cells that are still alive. All right, so letter B in your outline. The vascular tissue allows the plants to grow larger because the plant has a way to distribute water and sugar throughout its body. So this is a really key term in terms of why or how plants can grow larger. If you are a tiny, tiny plant like a moss, right, then the, your entire body is close to the ground and it's going to, if it's moist, you know, the entire body can absorb that water because you're such a small little plant and you live in these moist habitats. But as soon as you develop a network of tubes, this vascular system that can transport water around your body, then you can get bigger. Then these plants will grow bigger because they have the ability to move that water from their roots up to the upper part of the plant. So having vascular tissue is key in larger plants being able to evolve. You're not tied to the surface of the earth where there might be some water. And then letter C, let me just show you this. So the vascular bundle here that you see, the phloem and the xylem, they travel together. Just like in animals, we have arteries and veins that travel together. Um, so do plants. And that unit where xylem and phloem travel together is called um, a vascular bundle. And you can see these in the leaves. Um, let me show you another picture here, right? So again, if you look very closely at a leaf and you see those lines, that's not xylem or phloem, it's xylem and phloem together traveling in a bundle. And even here in a celery stalk, you can really see these cool areas, these, these round areas, that's the vascular bundle of celery. All right, and then next we have reproductive structures. So reproductive structures are gonna be different on land because land is dry, it can be very hot. Egg and sperm are not gonna be in water um, and kept moist. So plants have to develop ways that get the egg and sperm to each other um, in a, you know, in a, in a non-moist environment on land. So they've developed different ways to do this. Um, number one, some plants actually, just like the, the mosses here, they actually still release the egg and sperm out into the world. But since moss, if you think about it, you only find them in very moist environments where it's wet and rainy a lot. Um, they actually just release the egg and sperm and then they swim to each other. So they're close together, but they, they still swim to each other. Some plants will make egg and sperm and then when they fuse, they make a spore. And the spore is the entity that carries this 2N cell around for dispersal. And then some plants will protect their egg and sperm through structures of a flower or pollen. So this is gonna be flowering plants. So in terms of the details here under number four in your outline, I'm gonna talk about those details when we talk about flowering plants. Because flowers and seeds and fruit, those are all parts of um, flowering plants. And so I'll, I'll go into detailing to talk about the flowering plants, otherwise called angiosperms. Okay, so let's talk about, um, yeah, so like I said, the re plant reproduction on land, um, there needs to be some structure to contain egg and sperm because the land is dry and hot and very deadly to cells that are just out in the open. 
Um, there are things called spores, there are seeds, there's flowers, there's fruit. So we'll talk about all these uh, things in just a minute. <clears throat> so alternation of generation, let's cover this before we move on. Um, plants are very interesting because they have two different sort of life st cycles or life stages. They have two life forms. Um, one is called a gametophyte and the other one's called the sporophyte. Gametophytes make gametes and sporophytes make spores. Um, and then they also make each other. So gametophytes will eventually turn into a sporophyte. Sporophytes will eventually turn into a gametophyte. So let's move around this diagram and hopefully this will make sense to you. So let's start with, and this is a little bit of a, a little change because, um, all right, let's start with this gametophyte. I meant as a change because we know how you make gametes, right? The gametophyte starts off haploid. So this is already an N entity, right? N versus 2N, N is haploid. So gametophytes are a structure of the plant that's already haploid. So when they make a gamete, when they make egg or sperm, there's no meiosis that happens here. It's just because they're already haploid. So your gametes are haploid, and that should make sense, right? Gametes are always haploid. When gametes fuse and the egg and sperm fuse, you have fertilization, and then you get a zygote, which is diploid, and that should make sense. We've talked about that before. Zygotes are diploid, 2N. So the zygote will divide and divide and divide and form a plant that plant's called a sporophyte. The sporophyte, of course, is diploid because we started off with a zygote. Now, in the sporophyte, the sporophyte will undergo meiosis, okay? And when it undergoes meiosis, <clears throat> we're making spores. The spores are haploid. When those spores are liberated into the world, right, they're going to land somewhere, and then they're going to form, they're going to grow into a gametophyte. And that gametophyte is haploid because the spore was haploid. Gametophytes make gametes, and the whole cycle begins again. So gametophytes make gametes. Sporophytes make spores. <clears throat> you just have to remember here that the spore is going to be haploid. And the sporophyte that makes the spores, in order to go from 2N to N, right, we have meiosis happening here. We also see that gametophytes eventually become a sporophyte, and sporophytes eventually become a gametophyte, right? So they cycle between those two life stages. So that's why we call it alternation of generation. We'll look at some examples and hopefully the examples will make a little bit of sense to you. All right, so before we move on, just remember that the ancestor to all plants is our green algae. And the green algae that exists today, which is this guy here, a carophyte, is thought to be probably the most similar to the ancestral plant. All right, so we're going to pause here, I think.